have symmetries in quantum field. Please take it away. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sam, for the introduction. And thank you again for the uh, invitation to speak here. Uh, it's my first time to the country, and actually to the continent. So I'm, I'm very happy and excited to be here. Um, great. So, yeah, so today uh, I sort of wanted to give you a sort of a taste or like an introduction to the idea of generalized symmetries um, in quantum field theory. Um, and so I guess I, before I really get started, I wanted to give you a little, uh, I guess, introduction to the introduction. Um, in, in that, uh, sort of, these lectures are going to be very, um, they're probably going to be very technical. Um, but really, the, my goal for these lectures is not to give you like a very broad overview of everything that people have done in the past, I don't know, 5, 10, 20 years on this subject, but rather to give you like some very, some very concrete tools that you can use to go read any of the literature that you're interested in. And so my philosophy is actually that it's much uh, more useful to understand a few things very well rather than to sort of understand a bunch of things like in passing. And so, yeah, so uh, really throughout the entire lectures I encourage you, if you have any questions, or if I'm going too fast or too slow, just uh, tell me and we can work with it. Okay, so uh, the idea of general asymmetries um, has sort of been revamped in the past, I guess, seven to ten years. Um, and now there's this sort of hierarchy of general asymmetries. So we're going to be sort of mostly focusing on something that's called a hydrogen symmetry. Um, and these are ones that are what I would call group like in the sense that they're uh, well described a group theory. Uh, so this is actually just a small subset of a larger set of symmetries called higher form symmetries. Or, I'm sorry, higher group symmetries. And uh, these are actually even uh, a subset of an even larger category or a group that are called categorical symmetries. And uh, so the point is that these two um, different classes are not group-like. And uh, what I mean by that is they actually require a general framework of category theory. Hence the name categorical symmetries uh, to describe them properly. Um, so, as I said, we'll mostly be focusing on this higher form symmetry uh, because, uh, well, anyways, I don't, I don't really want to just go through a whole lecture on what category theory is and how to use it. I thought it would be much more useful to use things that are more concrete and show up more commonly in quantum field theories about two dimensions. Um, but I will talk about these and some applications of them uh, in, on, my, on the third day. So, okay. cool. so I wanted to give you sort of a, a roadmap of where we're going, um, just so that uh, you don't get if you're bored, you know that there's something to look forward to, hopefully. So uh, I'm going to try to organize them by the day, since I'm doing two lectures in the first three days. Uh, so today is mostly going to be um, an introduction, and I'm going to talk about these higher form global symmetries, uh, continuous <coughs> higher form global symmetries, and I'm also going to give you um, a review on terminology of differential forms. which is sort of one of the fundamental mathematical tools that's used um, in describing uh, general asymmetries. Um, day two is going to be a little bit more technical. We're going to talk about discrete uh, symmetries and gauge theory. And by this I mean uh, we're going to talk about what it means to have a discrete gauge theory as well as what it means to have discrete symmetries in 
normal uh, gauge theory is like non abelian gauge theory. And then, <coughs> well, if we're going to play on day three, we're going to have fun. We're going to talk about some nice applications <coughs> and these uh, categorical solutions. Okay. Does anyone have any concerns? Or, I mean, you got questions too. But. Great. Okay, so let's jump in. Cool. So let's start with uh, ordinary um, continuous symmetries. So by this, I mean let's take a d dimensional on field theory. And imagine you have some field phi and it's acted on by some group. So, I mean, for example, phi x goes to some group element and phi x. And what it needs to be for this to be a symmetry, classically, is that the action which is a functional of phi of x is invariant under phi of x goes to g times phi of x. Good. And so uh, one of the most powerful tools um, to study continuous uh, symmetries in classical theor uh, field theories is noise theorem. Uh, which tells us that to uh, a conserved symmetry group G, we have a conserved current. And uh, we can get this, of course, by, uh, I guess, the Noether procedure, where um, what you do is you look at um, the function, the, the, the variation of the action, where you allow G to be spaced Socially dependent. So you look at this, minus s phi. And what you find is that uh, there's some term that looks like the derivative of uh, some alpha and the okay. Where I'm taking G of X is the P of Is 
So, uh, first we need the contribution equation. As I said, it's an operator equation. Um, but this is only uh, true in the empty correlation function. More generally, the Euler's theorem tells you that there is a contact term if you have some operator that's charged or that transforms under a symmetry of G. Uh, so, sorry, so what I'm saying is that if I, under the symmetry group transformation, this goes to like G to the Q, um, and so G to the Here, just keep in mind, I'm just keeping in mind G is like a U1 gauge group, a uh, U1 symmetry group, for example, so this could be literally a phase. Um, but everything generalizes to non linear groups, as you know. Um, right, so now Euler theorem is actually more generally given by, well, this is equal to and what this says is that um, you can think of this charged operator as a source term for the current. So, in particular, what I mean is that this is the more general uh, conservation vision. So, yeah, that's cool, but what does that mean in terms of, um, I guess, how we normal, normally think about symmetries in, in quantum theories? So, so, usually we think about quantum theories in terms of quantum spaces. So to any quantum theory, uh, you can define a whole space. And that tells you almost essentially everything you want to know about, about theory. It gives you all the states, and uh, when I tell you a whole space, I also mean it tells you all the energies, for example. Um, good. But so to a quantum field theory, this is a little bit more complicated than in quantum mechanics. Um, because uh, in order to specify a whole space, you actually would need to specify some sort of what you mean by a spatial, uh, spatial slice of space time. So, um, in other words, uh, so if you're in like a, a Minkowski space time, or in more general, a Lorentzian space time, uh, you have to pick, pick a notion of time. So you have to pick a time direction. And then what you have is a bunch of spatial slices that are all perpendicular to the space, so this time direction. So uh, I'm going to call them sigma, so t. So this is a spatial, uh, spatial directions, I guess. So d minus one, of course, spatial directions at time. So. Uh, once you make this choice, then you can define a Hilbert space. And I'm going to call this Hilbert space H and sigma. Okay. Uh, 
then you would say that the operator, is an operator, the operator q hat um, acting on each h i is a particular q sub i. Um, good. But I didn't really even tell you in this formalism what it means to have a symmetry. So in this formalism, what it means is that you have this charge operator, q hat of sigma. And it commutes to the Hamilton. Right? And so this tells you that once if you pick a state in one of these h sub i's, um, time evolution, which is given by, uh, which is generated by your Hamiltonian operator, will not take you outside of the uh, outside of the Hilbert space. So this tells you that you have. So that the, the charge is conserved. And so this is why we call these different super, as super selection sectors, um, because the dynamics of your theory cannot take you from one sector to another, because um, the charge literally commutes with time evolution. Okay. So given this operator Q, you can actually explicitly construct how uh, G acts on your homework space. So Let's pick uh, some fixed state psi. And um, good. And so now I want to show how a G acts here. And what you can do is literally given an element G in your symmetry group, where you write G is e to the pi alpha, um, well, G is alpha is pi. Think of this as one. Then uh, this G acts on your Hilbert space by the operator e to the pi of q hat. Right? Um, yeah. Good. Is that clear? So, um, as we know, Hilbert spaces, or the uh, states in the form of theory, can usually be made up by acting with local operators, um, operators, on the vacuum state. And uh, we, do, we always pick our charges, and it start, uh, when the case when your symmetry is not spontaneously broken, so that the vacuum state has charge zero. And so now what we can try to do is figure out how uh, this action on your, on your state, um, yeah, or sorry, I, I guess I'm over one more So, so we're going to take some psi i, which is in a super selection sector h i, just to tie back to here. And I'd say this action is e i alpha q i. So this is this is what it means for the symmetry act in the super selection type here. So we want to sort of be able to reproduce this action by thinking about how the symmetry acts on these operators. Okay? So uh, what we can do is just um, say g hat acting on psi. So G hat and hat. And then we can sort of insert uh, G and first G here, since uh, G acts trivially on the vacuum state. We can have this G hat G hat inverse. And this is like Uh, right, so what I'm doing is I'm putting a G inverse G, 
and then I'm using the fact that. Okay. Oh, um, Are you showing some uniqueness of vacuum, or in how general is this? Um, you need your symmetry to not be spontaneously broken, okay. um, because then the, your, your vacuum can have a charge, essentially. So now, now that our action of, of, of the symmetry has really become an operator equation. Um, and so we need to compute this, uh, I'm going to write out the g-head thing. So we do our alpha t-head, so I'm going to do the minus alpha t-head. Right. And so now we can use our lawyer theorem. To try to keep this. Um, right. So essentially, the point is uh, uh, right. In this. Um, so, so, so then you have one question. So the yeah. notation that you use in the last equation there, mm -hmm. uh, so the state g inside the g inverse inside the state. Yeah. You're just using that as a as a definition of what this. Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm just saying just that. Labeling, just labeling the state by the action. That's right. Yeah. I'm saying this, this is itself an operator. This is also the bias to the state. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, right. So maybe I should draw a picture. Sure. operator here, um, I actually know exactly how to compute this, uh, um, well, how to write these two down, using the fact, uh, using divergence theorem. Uh, so, right, uh, j0 d d minus 1 x on sigma minus, I'm uh, sorry, plus delta t minus j0 d d minus 1 Sigma of minus delta t. This is 
equal to the divergence um, on integrated on the space that's in between uh, these two slabs. So if you write <coughs> you fill this whole slab in and call it uh, uh, gamma, I guess. So this is that's how you get this equation. Yes. or as you're going to see extended operators. Um, and the reason for that, uh, we're going to get to shortly. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, yeah. So now, this is how you go from, uh, uh, good, so. <laughs> so we told you that um, this equation tells you uh, or in order to compute this in terms of how axon is operator, uh, we have to compute uh, this term, which I think, I hope that I argued to you nicely here, that that's going to be given by this. So essentially, what, why I'm putting a time order in here is because I'm actually going to integrate from here to here, and then also from here to here, because there's an operator that lives in this uh, slice. So that's why I put the time order in there, and that's sort of how you actually, that's formally how you recover the fact that there's it's a commutator. Um, but this is a technical point that you don't really have to worry about. Um, because So now what you can do is you can literally expand the exponential uh, in terms of uh, the normal uh, You can do the sort of normal uh, exponential expansion here. So, This is what the 
equation looks like. All right, this is the, what Noether's theorem tells us, is uh, the operator equation. And so, uh, in terms of, since this operator psi, we assume has charge Q, or has charge QI, we find that um, each term here, which looks like J mu x, U A D x, psi hat y, um, is going to equal to uh, QI. And so y is this point here, which is inside of the area you're integrating over. So this literally just becomes qi psi hat y. Okay. So now I'm going to erase this equation. And so now we can uh, plug this formula into our expansion. Some of this, and you find uh, the action exactly how you want it. Okay. So, right, so there's something sort of important that I was hiding from you in doing this computation. Um, and is that, like, essentially the question is why was I even allowed to do this? I guess I'm sort of figuring out. Um, and the point is actually related to this. So if I was actually, so if there was no operator in here, in, in between these, these two sheets, um, you would say that since, the, uh, since this current is conserved, this is actually going to be equal to zero. And so what that tells you is you're actually allowed to move this operator without paying any cost. It's a, in fact, we would say it's a topological operator. And that's what it means actually to have a, uh, a symmetry is that actually, uh, as we said, the charge operator can use the Hamiltonian, so you're allowed to move it in time for you. So, if you think about this operator, which is sort of dependent on a, a choice of t, this is independent of okay. um, So this computation makes sense to everybody. So here, um, I, that's also something I've been kind of cheating at, uh, is that here I'm saying Q is an operator that acts on this Hilbert space. And so what does this mean? I have, I'm sandwiching operators together that don't live in the same space. And so that's actually really strange. Um, but I think there is a sense in which you can, uh, there is some technical way in which this makes sense, as long as you take this limit as delta t goes to zero. But and the thing that allows you to do that is indeed the fact that this is a conserved current. So that's how they sort of all fit together.
was fun, but physics is not only fun. So, so everything we've been doing here has been explicitly dependent on a Hilbert space and time, taking a time direction, or having a time direction sort of handed to you by the universe. Uh, yeah. So, I don't think we fully understand the relation e to the i q psi to the minus i q equals time order. Uh, I mean, the Lipton's head is time order, mm -hmm. and the, the, on the top left order. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you get that equality? How do you go to the right hand side? Um, good. So, uh, right. So one way you can talk about um, taking a, a product in order is you fix a Hilbert space. Like, uh, so it's a Hilbert space down here, and then I just sort of I put these all at different times, and then I just smoosh them all and hit the Hilbert space with it. Yeah. So that's that's the, that's why I drew this picture this way. And so, um, this only makes sense. So, so maybe, maybe I should say the limit is delta t goes to zero of this, uh, of this picture. It, on the right hand side is the equality. Your, your, the, 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 the space and time that you're integrating over in that exponential, that's that choice of gamma t. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, this is the or gamma delta t. Yeah, this is the gamma delta t. Uh, this is at. <coughs> I guess this is at like y and then time uh, maybe one half delta t or something. Uh, yeah. It, does that make sense? Or, or was it helpful at least? Okay. Oh, you can ask me again afterwards if you want. Yeah. And we can I guess kind of do it. There are no divergences or anything to worry about. Um, right. There are no divergences. Um, and yeah, so that's a very special property, and it comes from the fact that it's a symmetry. Essentially, once once you have this, everything is super nice. Yeah, it's the, the magic of symmetry. Um, if this was, yeah, uh, um, yeah. So for example, if you if you imagine actually spontaneously breaking the symmetry, then this current is no longer conserved, and so it, you actually get some extra terms here, and then you're no longer allowed to do this uh, as freely. You have to be much more careful. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about. Yeah. Good. I was saying uh, I want to tell you sort of why why we did this. Um, we had a perfectly good Hilbert space. We knew how the, the symmetry acted. Like we could have just stopped there. Um, and the reason is that there are actually a lot of tools you get in studying quantum field theories by going to Euclidean space time. So by Euclidean signature, I mean that, um, uh, so, so usually for Lorentzian space time, for example, in the uh, there's a particular time direction. And then you have a Lorentz group, which is like all of your boosts and your rotations, your time translations, and all of that. So you have boosts, and you have this, uh, you have a null direction uh, in space time. Uh, and that's because your metric has, is an indefinite signature. So you'd say that your space is say maybe has a positive uh, uh, a positive uh, metric in the space direction, but there's a negative direct, negative signature in the time direction. Uh, but for Euclidean, just for example, r to the d, you flip this sign. And so you might ask, uh, why, why did I do that? And it's a good question. Um, right, so sort of formally, <coughs> the reason why you might want to do this is because when you look at the path integral, you know, think of it as 
It's an integral over all of your fields. So this is in Lorentzian symmetry. It looks like e to the f minus i of s. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm also setting h bar to 1 for every time, in case um, in case anyone's in there. But, but not a complaint. So this is sort of our normal uh, definition of the path integral. Uh, you get this minus i, which is a sort of um, comes from the fact that the time translation operator is unitary. Um, but mathematically, this is a very weird thing to define. It's generally believed that this is not well defined, I believe. Um, so mathematicians always get very mad at you to do this, or if you write this equation. <coughs> um, but if you uh, work with Euclidean time, the path integral looks maybe a bit nicer. You get the minus s. And for uh, a, for a um, oh, never mind. so uh, this is really nice because essentially the kinetic terms, as they go very large, are literally killed exponentially. So this actually defines a this is a well-defined object, we think, on uh, for most field theories. So you know formally that's great. Uh, more practically though, uh, it goes back to. Uh, So more practically, uh, in the Euclidean signature, you essentially get the same Hilbert space. Or now sigma is just any d minus one dimensional manifold. And essentially, that's, the point is that once you pick a space direction, uh, or once you pick some uh, you know, space direction, you pretend like the other direction is the time direction. And so what this does is it actually gives you a lot more data. Because if you just had, uh, for example, uh, a, a three-dimensional theory, you know, you'd sort of only be able to look at COVID spaces that were along the x and y directions. And that gives you a lot of data in your theory. But in your Euclidean theory, you can also look at Hilbert spaces that are perpendicular. And that gives you a whole new set of data. Um, it has to do with the sort of operators that are allowed in your theory. Um, is, that, is that really, would that really be a case in number three? I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's, I mean, what I'm saying is it's not the topology. Oh, yeah, that's true. Right. Yes. Yeah, I think generally you need more, because uh, you said, uh, non trivial topology. Good. So. Um, so can you do this when there's a there's not a global time like time direction? Like say you're working to sitter space, how much of this story still applies? Um, in terms of uh, describing uh, doing the Euclidean uh, yeah. Uh, yeah yeah right so yeah so this is an important point is that uh, Euclidean bond field theory is great because it gives you more tools to study the Hilbert space, but it doesn't tell you the dynamics. It doesn't tell you the dynamics of your form theory. So um, a picture people often draw. Uh, OK, so something that's really nice about including the, the quantum field theory is that this is well-defined. It's actually usually much more calculable than in this. And um, there's, a, there's a notion that you can actually prepare states in your Hilbert space by doing this path integral. So, um, if you imagine for a moment your space time, uh, or you're, you wanted to prepare some space here on, on your, uh, uh, so this is R2, and you're in some three dimensional theory, what you can do is you can do a Euclidean path integral on, uh, well, I guess I drew it as a, as a ball, excuse me, but um, if this is any manifold, um, three, that has a boundary which is R2, then the path integral on this space prepares a state on R2. Um, this, yeah, okay. uh, this is more formal than I was uh, planning to get to, but it's still important to understand. So the way people often use Euclidean quantum field theory is to, to use it to, to construct the Hilbert space explicitly. 
So this is literally a some state, and usually it's a vacuum state. Um, but what we can do is we can put operators in the of x in your path integral. And what that would do is then prepare a state that looks like psi, you know, psi of x times 0, or maybe some and more generally a non trivial state here. So usually what people do um, when, they're, when they work with Euclidean quantum field theory is they imagine you know, doing uh, this path integral, say, you know, draw a kind of weird thing. Uh, yeah. So, so, so you can think about going from a Lorentzian theory to Euclidean theory by take, by essentially complexity, or taking time to be imaginary. So here I'm drawing like a, this is like real time, and this is like imaginary time. So if you do this path control with some operator here to make a state. Then what you can do is you can try to compute the dynamics um, using Lorentzian uh, path integral. So what you can do is you can literally stitch together uh, a Euclidean and a Lorentzian path integral to figure out the quantum dynamics of a particular state. And this is done a lot in, I think, quantum gravity, actually. Um, so can you explain the picture once? Yeah, good. So, so here, what I'm doing is I'm first this is sort of like a, a two-step process. So it's like step one is you do the Euclidean path integral uh, on this, this space with an open, open boundary here. Uh, so which are you thinking about the edge, or is it the? It's this, uh, this thing here. You, you think of this as some manifold. Um, it's a Euclidean manifold M, which has a boundary, which is uh, this line. And then you sort of continue it into Lorentzian space-time after you've done this path integral. So this is one way you can think about quantum field theory in a particular state, is you first prepare the state by doing what you path integral, and then you time evolve using Lorentzian quantum field theory. Um. So do so you mean that you, you start off with a, you have a, you have an ill-defined quantum integral, Lorentzian quantum integral, mm -hmm. then you transform time goes to imaginary time. Mm -hmm. Now you have a well-defined Lorentzian quantum field which you can compute. Mm -hmm. Once you compute it, you transform back, and you now like, now you have a well-defined thing where you transform back again. Uh, is that what you're saying? And that's not what you're saying. Um, yeah, I think what, I, what I'm trying to say is that uh, Euclidean is a tool. You, Euclidean quantum field theory is a tool that gives you a Hilbert space and a, a way to construct it explicitly. And then you can try to do the normal things you do in quantum field theory or in quantum physics in, after you construct the states. Um, the, the normal thing we do, whatever that is, <laughs> which may or may not be technically well defined, but you know, we're, we're physicists, we're not mathematicians, but who cares? I think there's an advantage in doing it this way than creating new states canonically or uh, um, not usually between but you're gaining something. But, uh, yeah, right. So. Um, that's a good question. We don't know. Yeah, that's not it. Addition of curve manifold or something, maybe it's easy. Maybe this makes more sense somehow, or I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, than just having raised and lowering. Um, I'm actually. I think, I think the point, or the, the idea, is you're supposed to be able to more easily construct non perturbative states mm -hmm. doing this. Um, I mean, this sounds more covariant somehow, right? Yeah, I think, I think that's essentially the point. Like, you know, if we want to create a state in the Lorentzian thing, you may, you, you take your field and you smear it and make, make some little lump, and then you just sort of let it go. But this is sort of like saying, I hit the system a long time in the past and I let it evolve and it's some big quantum state. Um, so to check, um, I may just want to Take your correct visual state integral over any degree for a equal part integral that they found on their path five. This one? Yeah. This one? Yes. Path six, five. Yeah. Yeah. So this would be like uh no, no, yeah. Putting path integral on three. Yeah. Gives you this six. Cool. Yeah. Um 
Yeah. So, so I, I know this 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 is sort of the motivation why we why we usually study Euclidean quantum field theories. Um, but there's actually even more tools than the, uh, that are allowed when you go to Euclidean quantum field theory. And essentially the reason is that you have an entirely new set of um, manifolds that you can put your quantum field theory on. Um, Lorentzian manifolds are very particular and they're always non-compact and they have all these weird, essentially it's because they have null directions. So you have these, you always have an infinity, infinity to look at. But for a Euclidean quantum field theory, you can only, you, there exist compact manifolds. So you can put your theory on there. And then when you have your theory on a compact manifold, you actually get a finite spectrum. And that allows you to much more uh, rigorously study the theory, including uh, figuring out what sort of anomalies it has. Um, and that's sort of one of the most um, powerful tools. Um, well, I think it's one of the most powerful tools for studying the <laughs> including one of the um, Anyway, so this is just a motivation as to uh, why you want to look at the quality of the quantum theory. And maybe the last uh, five or ten minutes, I'll tell you how um, this picture um, allows us to sort of understand symmetries in the Euclidean quantum field theory. assigns a corporate space to any manifold. So uh, what that means is that you have to be able to for a, a conserved current or for a conserved symmetry. Um, you have to have, be able to assign a charge operator to any closed manifold. So it's an operator sigma for any d minus one dimensional manifold. And um, you can exponentiate it to get to the group action on uh, that orbit space. And these are usually, or often written in literature like this. But what it really means is that they're just doing the same thing. Um, so these are often called uh, symmetry defect operators. Um, but now it's really important, uh, this computation, to understand how the symmetry acts in the space, in a given open space. Right? So, what I told you is that um, the Euclidean path interval gives you space. Um, and by Euclidean path interval, I mean on some open manifold with some operators and so forth. So, um, indeed, if we have this picture here, so this is our manifold, and we have an operator in here, um, we can put this new G on, uh, on the boundary here, and then to think about how the symmetry acts in the state, what we can do is we can actually um, bring it sort of further and further in into this, uh, into this manifold M until it hits the operator side. So, so you know, I'm just to explain, so now we're talking about the same picture that you're giving the signatures. Yes, yeah, that's right, good, yeah. All right, so, um, so the symmetry acting on the side is, uh, is this picture. And so you either think about it as literally acting on this, uh, on the state, um, acting uh, that lives on this boundary, or you can think about it as acting on this operator. And acting on the operator is equivalent, because all states, the Euclidean quantum field theory tells us that all states in the Hubbard space are created from these operators. So um, rather than talking about the Hubbard space, it's just easy, easier to think about how these, uh, um, these symmetry defect operators act on local operators. So, so can you explain what, what yeah. And so usually that's true for conformal QFT, it's right here, the operator is the correspondence. You're saying that in the QFT, there's always an operator is the correspondence. 
Right, so the, right, it's much more complicated for Euclidean quantum field theory in general because there's, um, uh, because essentially you can write a lot of operators now, not just the local ones, there's a lot of, there's a sort of an infinite number of non local ones as well. Um, but uh, here we're thinking about uh, the action of the symmetry. And essentially, the way we're defining the symmetry is it acts only on local operators. So all you have to worry about is uh, the set of states that are active that are generated by these local operators, up to the action, up to the insertion of other operators that don't act with them. You know. And that's sort of what we're going to talk about next lecture. Okay. Yeah. So, so you decide there, or should you think of it as just some derivatives on the field, or uh, like some? Yeah, it, it just some. Maybe the new fire or something. Yeah, like exactly. That. Yeah. Or if it's a gauge theory, some trace operator. Exactly. Like, this is general, right? It could be a gauge theory. Yeah, yeah. Just any gauge invariant local operator. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, so, so essentially the point is that in Euclidean, in Euclidean picture, uh, the action of the symmetry on states is equivalent to the action. On local operators. So, so in this Lorentzian picture, that's totally non-obvious. And I just said, suppose you had some state that's created this way. In the Euclidean picture, I'm telling you this is true. And so, this is why people usually think about uh, symmetries as acting on uh, uh, only on the operators themselves. So, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, please. Answer this question, but, um, why is it why is it not not totally non-obvious in the in the Lorentzian picture? Um, I mean, I guess, I guess, well, maybe it's, yeah, it's easy. Yeah, um, I think because you have to worry about locality much more. Okay. That, and that is what distinguishes it from the UK. So I guess maybe, maybe a different way, a different question is why, what is the distinction between the Euclidean and the Lorenzian that makes this statement true in the Euclidean? Yeah, okay, that's, that's a good question. Um, um, honestly, I actually don't know proof of this. Um, I, uh, this is, I think this is probably a deep statement in algebraic quantum field theory, <laughs> um, which I'm not actually expert on. Well, is it just that operators outside of like on Lorentzian signature, they have to commute? Yeah. Whereas in Euclidean signature, they don't. They don't. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think that's essentially what, the, what makes it much trickier. Uh, so in Lorentzian space time, if you have operators uh, that are outside each other's light cone, they have to commute just identically. But in, in Euclidean quantum field theory, that's not true. Why does that make it better than It doesn't make it better. It just uh, it, it tells you that. Well, yeah. It's not, somehow, well, maybe this intuition is completely wrong, but it somehow tells you that in Euclidean, the local operators felt everywhere. Right? So, you, so there, there's a lot going on in the local operators. And in Lorentzian, you have to worry about all these sub regions in space and time. And yeah. yeah. That's something maybe. I, I think that's correct. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry. I don't think I have anything deeper to say. I think there is some other deeper statement. I just uh, I don't know what it is. But the statement is that this uh, this this sandwiching between uh, slices is much neater in Euclidean. Yes, right, exactly. So here I was sort of I I had to pick time direction. I could only move in the time direction. Um, here, uh, since this is a symmetry, it's not that we don't say any longer that Q commutes with the Hamiltonian. Because Hamiltonian is it's it's every direction. Yeah. So rather, what you have is that the Q, Q actually commutes with the stress tensor. Uh, but then you just talk about it. And uh, indeed, actually, if you instead of just writing uh, uh, you know, delta t and minus delta t, you know, different times. If you just wrote sigma one and sigma two, this equation is still true. 
essentially, the fact that it's conserved tells you that that's why it should be a topological, uh, uh, or, or rather, why this operator here should be a topological operator. And so, um, rather than thinking about like, infinite slices um, with a, an operator in between, when you're putting it there, you can just take an operator and surround it by a ball. And then what you could do is you could squeeze the ball sort of through this local operator. So at some point, it's going to affect the sphere. And then you get this sort of picture. So this is ug, this is psi, this is psi ug. And then when this uh, sort of hits, um, when this operator uh, intersects with the local operator, you can use uh, the Noether theorem to show that there's actually a G action on this operator. So this is going to be G dot. And now, since this is a, a sphere, you can totally contract it to zero because it's a topological operator. So this is This is sort of um, how people think about um, ordinary symmetry that act on local operators in uh, Euclidean quantum field theories. And um, after the break, I'll finish up and tell you, I'll just talk about sort of, um, if you have a symmetry, how you couple it to um, background gauge fields, why we do that, and uh, what, you, what power you give them time. So, I think this is probably the place to start. Maybe just a little bit of Maybe you probably already mentioned, but I think I missed it. But there is, we have a lecture note uh, on this mm -hmm. the archives if people want to read up or yes. um, that's a bit of like what you gave a reference. Yes, I, I did. I can do um, it again, I think. And uh, let's take a break so that, uh, yeah. I'll write it up again. So there should be, there's coffee and snacks upstairs. Um, so let's take a half an hour break. So we start again at uh, 11.40. We're starting in here? I think we have to start in here. But anyway, bring your bags and stuff in any case. Because, uh, yeah, I'll check. Maybe in the honors presentation, I'll let you know. <laughs> Just <to be> here. <laughs>